Yo, it's Duff of the Cloud Chaser TV, man. We back up in this thing again, you dig? Hey, man, we got a special guest. It's a legendary interview we about to do on Troy Reed, man. Troy Reed, before we even get started, can you can you let them know where they can uh, follow you at and find I, your new book? Oh, yes. You can follow me at, at Troy Reed Official. That's on Instagram and also at Street Star Streaming Official on Instagram as well. So uh, once again, that's a Troy Reed Official. And street star streaming official on Instagram. Dope, 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 bro. Man, what a story, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah, start, yeah. Uh, we gonna start. You know, I, I noticed a lot of people was doing the interviews with you, and um, uh, you know, I want to start with you first. Then we'll get into the Alpo situation. Like, um, far as like, where you from, bro? Can you let them know where you from? Let's yeah, I'm from the South Bronx. Uh, right at the end of like the right from the edge of the South Bronx. Uh, project called Patterson Projects. And that's like the first, it's like a project, it's what they call it, the Mott Haven section of the Bronx. So that's where you have like a set of projects of uh, Mitchell's, uh, Melrose, Cortland, Patterson, Forest, all this is like the edge of the South Bronx. So that's where I'm from, like the Mott Haven section of the South Bronx. Oh, dope, dope, dope. So like growing up in that area, what was it like, bro? Like doing the time frame, uh, did you come up in the 80s? Yeah, I came up in the 80s, really like the late 80s. But time I got started, I was like, time I kind of got out on the street, I was probably about like 17 years old, you know, from, you know, but before that, you know, I was always just a good kid running around playing basketball, girls, you know, doing that kind of thing. And um, the South Bronx was always amazing because it's the last section of the Bronx before you go into Harlem. So a lot of whatever was taking place in Harlem, which Harlem was like the mecca of New York City, you know, you got all the boroughs, but... Harlem is where everything pretty much should take place. So the South Bronx, because we at the edge, everything that was in Harlem kind of spilt over to my section of the Bronx. And um, growing up, you know, you got to see from my same neighborhood is um, Guy Fisher, Tiny Archibald, Iran Barkley, um, Arnold Bernard, uh, Showbiz, AG, you know, AG really, but that whole crew was over there. So it's a lot of history where I come from over in the South Bronx. So, you know, growing up, you always seen everything you know you saw some of the first battles of hip-hop grandmaster flash um you know the gangs uh, uh lord finesse and big l doing their first battles you know was happening in my neighborhood so it was a lot of history right there so you know you've seen a lot growing up there oh no doubt no doubt and you know being from like the bronx it's it's it's, it's pretty much like that's that's the home of hip-hop so yes it was a lot going on when it came to hip-hop during that time right was it the rise like the uh, beginning did you see it firsthand? Oh, I saw it. You know, I remember when my man, this kid named Chuck and my man, Sean, they was bringing the first mixtapes of the cold crush and all that into the buildings. So we sit in the buildings in the, on, the, on the steps on the front of the building and they had a little, you know, beatbox and, and they'd be playing all the first cold crush tapes. And, you know, I watched Grandmaster Flash. You know, I remember one time I ran into Grandmaster Flash. I was a young boy and one of his somebody in his crew got stabbed up and they had to take him over to Lincoln Hospital and we just followed them all the way into the hospital and we trying to ask him for autographs but they trying to check on his man while he was stabbed up so I watched I watched the evolution of rap grow because my project Patterson Projects was like one of those projects that was part of that with the black spades casting over and all that so it was part of that whole movement so I definitely saw that when I was young Okay, and like with the, the media, like was it, it any forms of media at that time when it came to us? Nah, there was no real media back then. You know what I'm saying? You got to remember the first rap album was Sugar Hill Gang. Like everything else, it's kind of like now almost how you got the internet. You got YouTube and Instagram and all that. And like like say like YouTube is, it's kind of like it was. it's a phenomenon. It's its own little world. And that's how uh, rap music was back then. It was like if you had a... You had to have a cassette tape to hear rap music at that time. It was it wasn't even on a vinyl at that point. You had to hear a cassette tape. So you know it was it, it, things was more authentic. They was real. You had to be, come with your best. You know you had to be in the trenches and stuff. So, um, there, but there there wasn't definitely like today. You know what you guys are doing right now. You know what I'm saying that's why I take my hats off to y'all and I put all you guys in the book and all the people that I didn't. Let me say this to all the people that I didn't mention the bloggers and. Um, all the people with digital platforms on YouTube and Instagram. I'm so inspired by y'all. And even if I didn't mention it, this goes to you because what y'all doing 
is like you can wake up, sit in your house, sit wherever you at, and just reach millions and hundreds of thousands of people. And that's why I call it, a, a, you know, that's why I love it, calling it black media. You know what I'm saying? Because it's amazing Absolutely. and you get to create your own lane. And this is the main reason why I even put, you know, the names that I could fit in the book, you know, in there, you know, and try to show some love. No, I, I definitely appreciate that you shouting us out in that book, um, mm -hmm. you know, because, you know, a lot of times, you know, on the come up, you don't get too many shout outs until, you know, you blow up or something like that. You know, you know, come from your background, seeing that shout out. That was very dope, man. I appreciate yeah, thank, that. Yeah. So, thank you, my brother. Y'all deserve it. All of y'all. Rev, I mentioned you. I didn't mention if you're on that platform, you too, you know, and, and uh, you know, like I said, hats off. I'm definitely inspired by y'all. And, uh, you know. If somebody's ignoring your call now, in the next two or three years, they won't be ignoring your call. Trust me, because y'all the lane. You know what I'm saying? No, oh, no doubt, no doubt. And um, so now you know you, you like you you moving around. You see what's going on. You got the the hip hop. You know you come from that background. How did the media come around? Like how did you get involved in media? Uh, well, my first inspiration for media was a video that. I think showbiz, but I know AG, uh, showbiz and AG shot in my neighborhood because they from my neighborhood. And the first time I got a glimpse was I I just stopped hustling and I saw uh, AG, the rapper AG shooting a video called um, Get Dirty or something like that. And he had a whole set and everything. And he had a, a truck, makeup truck with, with girls in it and all that. And this whole big set. And that was the first time that I was up and close on the cameras. From that day on, it was like, okay, yo, this is what I want to do. I want to, I want to, you know, I stopped hustling. I wasn't selling drugs no more. And it was kind of like, yo, this is what I want to do. And and I actually, I missed my, my lane with them because when AG started, you know, I was right there when he started out with the rap music. My guard brother's Diamond D. So I watched and witnessed all of them putting together the, the rap thing. And I was always right there next to, to them, but I wasn't, the streets was more alluring to me, hustling. So what I wish, I always look back and say, I wish I would have, you know, got in that lane with them and got into the music business somehow, some way, shooting music videos, managing, producing, doing whatever. But, you know, that was something that I always look back and go, dang, I wish I would have jumped in that lane when they was in that lane. Um, but, you know, but I didn't, you know, I caught back up by doing a documentary. So, um, but I got to contribute that to to my man, AG. Got you, got you. And, um, you know, once like once you, you you come in and you pick a lane and you know you went with the street route, wasn't any backlash with you going with that route versus like going with the hip hop? What was already you know what I'm saying um, noted at that time? No, nah, it was when I you know what made me do street stars and I spoke about it is I was I always saw all of the the hustlers. I always saw the hustlers from the early '70s all the way to the early '80s. You know, I kind of got in the game late after they was already gone, uh, you know, selling crack cocaine, stuff like that. So, But there was no real money like that when I got into it, um, like in, in, in 90, 91 and stuff like that. You know, everybody was out of town. But I already saw all of the I, – I grew up just witnessing all that. So that's what made me even start Street Stars. And um, originally it was a magazine, and – um. You know, but the feds wind up, feds magazine wind up doing the magazine version of it. And, you know, hats off to them because they paved the way as well. You know what I'm saying? Feds magazine. So, you know, once I saw what feds was magazine was doing and Don Diva, you know, started once I saw them doing anything, it was kind of like, you know what? Let me do video because they already got the print covered. Let me do video. And um, a friend of mine is my man named Prince, which is Mark down in Atlanta. He kind of took me to meet AZ because AZ was the last person on the street. So that was the person that, you know, kind of opened the door for me to do my thing. And AZ was already getting in the lane to try to get in the film business because he just wrote the movie Paid in Full, which was originally called Trap. And uh, and what I was doing was coincide with what he was trying to do. So we just partnered up and uh, we just we just started filming and made it happen. No doubt, no doubt. And um, you meeting AZ, did like did y'all build a relationship off top, or did it come like over the years? I mean, me and AZ instantly clicked. You know, the same relationship I had with Outpo at one time I had with AZ. You know what I'm saying? Because 
at that time when I connected with AZ, he was into God. And I was just getting into a relationship with God because, you know, when you're a young man, you're 17, 18, at this time, no, probably at this time, I probably was like 24, 25. And I just stopped hustling. And uh, at that time, I was searching on how to be a man. You know what I'm saying? And, uh, you know, man that was in front of me was good, but I needed somebody higher and bigger than myself and bigger than man. And that's what made me get into a relationship with God. So him, him at the same time, he was already in at that place. You know, he'd been to hell and back. So he was already at that place spiritually. So me and him connected, we clicked because we had a spiritual relationship. You know what I'm saying? Everything was based to God, reading the Bible, Bible studies, and, and the Quran and everything else. We were seeking out understanding, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding at the highest level at that time. So we clicked. And then us just doing the, the, the street stuff was just... It was like they was hand in hand. We was doing something spiritually, but at the same time, we said, let's put, we knew that we was doing something that the world never seen before. No doubt. And, um, you know, I, I, I like to ask you this. Like, I know a lot of people, they got different, um, like the way they think of the word when they hear narrative, like somebody's painting a narrative. But uh, my question is, like, when you're doing these, these interviews or these documentaries, you have to have your own narrative, correct? Now, when, you know, one thing I learned, and this just comes from a spiritual aspect, is to stay neutral. I'm not no judge and no jury of nothing and nobody. You know what I'm saying? My job as a journalist, documentary, is to tell stories. You know what I'm saying? Don't take no sides. Don't, don't, because you got a relationship with somebody. Don't get a, don't get a story towards them. You know what I'm saying? Um, just tell a, 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 a true story. You know, my book right now, you know, you know, some people may like it, some people may not like it, but it's just my story. You know what I'm saying? So I can't really please people with trying to tell my story. You know what I'm saying? So, and that's how I go about, you know, even in a book, how I wrote, how I used to go visit Guy Fisher. I used to go visit Outboy. I used to visit Larry Davis. I was dealing with Freddie Myers. I was dealing with uh, Preacher's Son, you know, my man Shaka and uh, Rafe Wedman's. All of those relationships was all compartmentalized separately. All those relationships, I never went to a visit and told somebody I was on a visit with somebody else. Or, you know, I always let them know out the gate my relationships, but we didn't talk about nobody else's business with each other. You know what I'm saying? So I always kept those relationships separate um, and, and, and uh, just tell a story. And sometimes if it's the truth, you know what I'm saying? If I think it's going to really damage hurt somebody you know fine might be after something i may have to leave out but for the most part is to tell the truth just about somebody's stories what it is no doubt no doubt and um you know moving forward so like you said guy fisher uh larry davis um alpo um uh, you know it's a bunch of different people that you did um documentaries on right and um when it came down to which documentary you think that push your brand forward the most um, man, well, I mean, I have to say the game over because the game over was like, no one never saw that. You know what I'm saying? Like no one, no one never saw like a hustler talk about the game. You know what I'm saying? So that was the one that kind of, and then it had a couple of different narratives with Pat Porter and different people inside of the Gangsta Lou and so many other different people that made that documentary. K Slade, God bless the day. He was pivotal in that with us. You know what I'm saying? Um, so that documentary was like, like Gladiator School was the, though it's like probably the worst looking documentary of all because we didn't know what we was doing. Um, but that documentary was the one and probably one of my also another, I got like two or three, but one of my other documentaries that I, that I liked that I did was called Scarface for Life because that was just like, I had, that was a story that I had to like piece together that. It was no real storyline. I didn't know what I was doing, but I just had to take all these brothers from my neighborhood and say, man, it's almost, they got almost two, 300 years amongst them of my friends, people I know that they've done in prison. You know what I'm saying? And God, you know, God willing, I never, you know, fell in that lane. You know what I'm saying? But I, I wanted to highlight them and the time and the stories they ever, they always told me. So Scarface was life was a, was a big one. And our Carton Hines story was a big one. Um, you know, because Carl Hines was nice and bull. Somebody I witnessed at 12 and 13 growing up, you know, watching him and seeing what he was capable of and knowing the lane 
that he should have went to the NBA. So these are other stories that was good. But ultimately, truthfully, from a business perspective, Alpo is just that key to the door. You know what I'm saying? It's just he's been that. You know, he's just that that key to the door that for some reason people just are infatuated with his story. You know what I'm saying? It's just like his story is the one. No doubt, no doubt. And was it like during this time, like, do you have like a criteria that you come up with that um you like, okay, how do you pick who you cause it's a lot of gangsters throughout the United States. And it's like, do you have a criteria who you want to um do the documentary on? I mean or it's just built, it's based on relationships. No, 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 no. Because there's stories of people I never met. So I try to find like since you know, I had to learn, like, I had to get to the when you're doing something independently. You got to learn. It took me a hard road and a long road, but you got to learn to how do I compete with machines? How do I compete with BET? How do I compete with MTV, VH1? How do I compete with that independently and do my own thing? And I had to learn that the hard way, but and that part of that was about learning how to become, make 50% business and 50% passion. Where before I used to just be 100% passion. But 100% passion, there's a lot of stubbornness in there. You know what I'm saying? Of what you will and what you won't do. So I had to learn, like, yo, T, now we're going to have to be 50% ba- um, business and 50% passion. So I started looking for stories that had big sensations to them. You know what I'm saying? Like, that had big. So Alpo was one of those stories that had a big sensation to it. You know what I'm saying? Meaning it moved the crowd. It makes you money. It, it allows you to do things. Because you need money to film your next project you need money to keep doing what you're doing build your brain so i had to kind of put that pie together with 50 50 50 passion 50 business and let me chase stories that can 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 allow me to eat and not only eat but allow me to do the next thing and the next thing after the next thing so um that's what allows me to like go after a certain story or pick a certain story because you know, in certain stories I miss, like I always wanted to do the Nikki Bond story because there's a lot of sensation at that time for it. Um, you know, Suge Knight's story I wanted to do, you know, or whatever. Um, I ran into him a couple of times. It was like, yeah, you know, I want to I want to do your piece or whatever. So I, I was just trying to find those stories. You know, I had one time I had Jim Master J story. You know what I'm saying? That, that, that story didn't go through. I filmed it and I finished it. But ultimately that deal fell through. But at that time, that was a big story for me. You know what I'm saying? So I would say, I would always tell somebody it's 50-50, baby. 50, you know, 50% passion, 50% business. Dope, dope, dope. And uh, moving forward, like, we're going to talk about the book. Like, uh, can you let them know the title of the book and, um, you know, what inspired you to make the book? I mean, yeah, the book is called I Never Met Alpo. And, um, you know, I was inspired by making a book for my wife from a couple of dudes that was locked up with Poe who personally called me, two or three dudes that personally called me that was in there that did that 24 years with him. And they knew the relationship that we had. They knew how he talked about me behind the bars, behind the walls. Um, and, and between those three or four people, it was kind of like, you know what? I ain't going to sit on this information. Let me put it out. You know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, I never get caught up in what somebody's saying about him or about rats or informants. I don't get caught up in that. I understand. You know, they play the game they way and that comes with it. People's opinions and how they see. So, but I just wrote the book because we had such a brotherhood and relationship that I wanted people just to see that side of him because he never would show nobody that side of him. He never would be vulnerable. He never, he would always nut up in front of men real quick. He never was going to show no weakness. Women they get to see that side of him. It's a thousand women could probably tell you that side of him because that's who he let in. But as far as men, he never let them in, but he let me in. So that's the part that I wanted to show that, man, he was a human being. He was thoughtful. He was understanding. He understand what he did as far as becoming a government informant. And he also understood his relationship with God more than anything. And God had bought him as far as he bought him. So those was the sides that I wanted to, show inside of this book that people can see this other side. And that's why the name of the book is called I Never Met Alpo because I never met Alpo. You know, I seen glimpses of him the last year and a half that he was alive. But me personally, 
I never saw that beast, that animal. Um, I never saw that person. So, so that was the reason why, you know, I had to separate the two out both from Albert. Okay. Got you. And, um, the first time you met him was uh, something with a girl, right? Like year, years prior to, um, you yeah, young girl, to Tammy. Yeah. 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 Girl named Tammy. Um, she, she was bad back in the day. She was bad. She was a young girl from my block. And like I said, because of where my neighborhood was on the edge of the South Bronx, everybody from Harlem came up to my projects. Um, you know, because you had all, you know, Nikki Barnes, everybody was in my projects at some point in some time. So when Poe came up there for that game, you know, which I put in the book and everything, when he came up there, I didn't know, I didn't even know who I was standing next to, you know what I'm saying? And, um, you know, like I said, he, you know, he, he wanted to get the number for the girl, offered me a hundred dollars and I put all this in a book so he could read it. Um, and, and that was the first time that I personally met him. I seen him, I seen him from like 12, 13, 14, cause I used to play basketball. So when I played in all the basketball tournaments in Harlem in this one Pacific tournament, um, I think it was called boys of yesteryear on 139th street and Lenox Avenue it was a big park. So we was the kids at that time, 12, 13. And after us was where the first Rucker Park, I think it was where they played, the entertainers tournament played on 139th Street. So we was the kids that played early in the daytime, but we would stay for those games around five and six o'clock for those games. And that's where I first had my glimpse of like, you know, the outposts and all the big dogs that was in New York City. I got you, got you. So you found out, he goes to jail. I'm pretty sure it's big, right? It was on the news and a bunch of stuff like that, right? So you found out he goes to jail. Are you currently doing the the, the media documentaries at the time, or is this going to be like one of the first ones? No, when he went to jail, I, I don't think I was doing a documentary because he got locked up in 91, so there was not, none of that being done. Um, uh, 92, one or the other, he got locked up, but... Um, I wasn't doing the documentaries like he did 14 years by the time I got to him. You know what I'm saying? So by the time I by the time I did my documentaries, I already had about three or four documentaries out before I got to him. So 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 it was just like, what's the next story? And like I said in the book, my man Pop from Black Star, you know, he had his ear to the street and he was like, Troy, listen, you need to jump on this outpo thing. And when he said something, I listened. You know what I'm saying? So, um, yeah, that's, 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 that's how I, that's when I started that one. Right. And then you, you know, you, um, one of your buddies or something, get you in tune where y'all put in to go meet him right in prison. How was that? Like that first meet, like, was he on the fence? Was he open or was he excited? Like, what, what was that first meet like? Oh, well, first thing for, let me give a shout out to my man, Paul Pillard, PJ. He's the one that introduced me to the kid named Oli, who was, going to see Alpo and who grew up in Alpo's neighborhood. And he was the only, my man Oli, God bless the dead, was the only person going to see Po during that time. Only male. Women were going, but they're only male. So uh, Oli took me on a visit and that's, and that's how I got, you know, to go see Po on a visit after getting clearance. And um, when I got there, like I said in the book, Po was, Po was just a regular dude. Like a, like a, a regular dude in the sense of the way he moved was regular, but his aura was Alpo. You know what I'm saying? Was his aura was, you know, oh yeah, that's 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 Alpo right there. Um, but he was a regular dude as far as there's no tough guy with him. There was no tough guy, there was no gangster, there's no, you know, there was no extra. It was just a cool dude that just like laughing and joking. That's it. That's all it was about, laughing and joking and jokes. So, like, watching the, like, you, you have you seen the Paid in Full movie? Yeah. So, like, watching the movie, do you think that, like, Cameron, like, his, the way he played that character in the movie, was that similar to, like, Alpo in real life? Like, you know, Chris Merrick and, you know, um... Um, you know, the energy that Cameron played was 100% Pope, but as far as the, the the he played that was one side of Poe. Let me say that that was one side of Poe, which 
I can't personally comment because, like I said, when he was on the streets, I wasn't in his circumference. You know what I'm saying? But from from what I know, and if I had to say, that was that was the part that if Poe was, you know, being tough or Poe something bothered Poe or Poe had to be out Poe. Yes, that Cameron played that to a T. But there was just another side of him that probably 80% of the time was just a fun outpo. You know what I'm saying? So that, that movie did Cameron hands down, like I call him the black scar face of paid in full of our generation. Um, so he did an amazing job, but that was just one side of him because he had the other side of him, which was the dude that just laughing jokes, laughing jokes. And anybody from his past will tell you that. Got you, got you. And now Al Poe, so now you got you build this relationship with him. How often are you going to see him at, at this point? Man, I was going to see Poe twice a week, you know, sometime once a month. I mean, I'm sorry, twice a month, every two weeks, and sometime once a month if I was filming or I had something to do and, you know, I couldn't get right there to him. But um, never, never no months went by without me going to see him for 10 years. Like, like I can't recall a time where I didn't go see him within that month for the last 10 years. Did he, did he have like thoughts? Like did, did anybody, like, did he know that he was going to get out eventually? Did he know that he had an out date or he thought that he was going to be in there forever? No, he, he, you know, that's what he signed up for the, to become a government informant for to get a date. You know what I'm saying? So he knew he was coming home. I don't think he knew he was coming home as soon as he was coming home because he could have did the whole 30 years, 28 years he had, and they could have made him do that. You know what I'm saying? But um, like I said, he was such a model inmate and such a different person that I guess that program and the government and the U.S. Marshals saw what I saw and was like, listen, he's ready for the streets. You know what I'm saying? So that's how he got out because it was like, if, if you know, I saw what they saw he was ready for the streets. So, so that's, you know, that's how he got out, but he didn't know he was getting out. You know, it, it was funny because we used to have a joke cause five years straight, he'd be like, little bro, I'm coming home. I'm coming home this year. I'm coming home in a few months. I'm coming home. And I was like, nigga, you stringing me along. You trying to string me along with that. You know what I'm saying? So that was like a joke between us and stuff, but um, it was all good because at that point it was, he was just like a brother at that point. You know what I'm saying? So I was just going to see a brother, the business side of it was already out of the picture. Got you. I got you. And um, I did like when people find out that, you know, you've been from New York and you are having these meets with Alpo. Is it any tension like they have towards you? Did they have any ill will towards you at that point? I mean, I ain't never had nobody come to my face and say, it. but, you know, the sound was definitely here and there. And more importantly, I don't care if it was from people that I don't know, but I would hear from people that I did know. But when I was in front of them, it was all love, but but I sound might come to me like you know this nigga say yo you know Troy messing with that rap, or he, you know this and that, so you know I I definitely did hear that over the course of time you know not an everyday thing but definitely here and there, but then again, I would always explain to somebody is, I'm a civilian I do films I do documentaries this is, this is a relationship based off that, I also understand the stance of, there's dudes that came home from doing 25, 26 years that I know, that's my man that I grew up with, that was in my circumference that I knew Poe was about to pull up. So I would pull them to the side and go, yo, listen, I got my man coming, such and such, and uh, I'm not sure if you're okay with that. If you're not, I'll catch up to you later, and I'm going to go meet with my man. And to my surprise, some of them same dudes, they would be like, nigga, it's all good. You know, you know this is what you do. You know what I'm saying? So don't worry about it. I ain't gonna hold it against you. You're a civilian. And um, sure enough, when he pulled up and they pulled up, I'll introduce them. And next thing I know, they outside talking or they they inside wherever we was at talking. And and once they got to know him, they kind of fell back, not from their stance of calling him a government informant a rap, but they just respected the situation. Can you tell us a story like something that can describe like um that he was human, he did have emotion. He wasn't like that, you know, this this famous killer, famous drug dealer that everybody tried to make him out to be. 
I mean, um, I got so many of those, you know what I'm saying? But just based off me, you know what I'm saying? Just off me. This is why my relationship was with him based off this. Two or three years ago, I had two years ago, excuse me, I had surgery. I got three open heart surgeries and I was getting a fibrillator put in my chest. He didn't understand the severity of it. You see what I'm saying? Because I'm so normal, I'm regular. Nobody never really noticed about me because I move regular. Um, but once he saw me in the surgery, I happened to face, he FaceTimed me that morning, the same morning I, they was willing me and they told me to cut my phone off, but I didn't cut it off because uh, I wanted to videotape it. He happened to FaceTime me. So he sees the lights, the surgery lights and all that over. He's like, yo, little bro, you really, you really twisted. You really, you know, it's really about to happen. So I had to hang up with him real quick. But when I got out of surgery, you know, he came to the crib to see me, you know, at least three or four times. And if you go to the book, it's a picture in the book where when I was healing, we laying next to each other because he would come and lay up next to me like a, you know, like like a brother. You know what I'm saying? And just lay up next to me, get on the phone and call, call, call girls, talk to girls on FaceTime, laugh and joke. And I'm, I put all this in the book. So this was something that made him, there was another side to him. You know what I'm saying? Because, and, and not only did he do this for me, but there's 20 other people that got the same similar story. You know what I'm saying? That that these are the things he would do for them. You know, he was real humanistic and down to earth and was a different dude. So I don't know that other side. I just know this side. You know what I'm saying? And when I started getting a glimpse of that other side, that's when we was, you know, parting ways. And I, I seen that Dr. Cha Cha, she had said something about um, it was a situation where you was having maybe financial trouble and Al Poe had um, helped you out. Can you tell us that story? Oh, all the time. All the time. You know, when you you doing your thing on your own, you independent today, you have $100,000 tomorrow, you might have $100. You understand what I'm saying? It's just what it is. You know, I don't, you know, so with him, there were so many times that it, throughout the course of our time, I mean, I always was there for him. You know, he knew that. But there were so many times that he was always there for me where, you know, if I didn't have it, and if I gave him a whiff that I didn't have it, oh, he got that right to me. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, you know, I got so many stories. You know what I'm saying? That if I didn't have it, I don't care if he had to go borrow it from somebody. He went and got that and gave that to me. You know what I'm saying? That's just who, and like I said, that story don't just go for me. That story go for whoever was in his comfort. He, he, he didn't respect money in that form and that fashion. So if he had it, you had it. And uh, speaking of money, you know, you, you see this, like the, the movie, you hear the stories. It seemed like, you know, he loved money. Like, so you saying that, he knew that money was just there to help people, like to assist with the helping of people. It's a different world today. You know what I'm saying? Like when just growing up, just not only him, but all the hustlers, like there was times when I was like 12 and 15 years old and I used to walk to Harlem to go play at Riverside Church or Gauchos or go play, like I said, in the basketball tournaments, right? And I might not have no money and I'm walking across the bridge from the Bronx to Harlem. By the time I got to Harlem to the game, I might have had about $100 in my pocket because probably three or four different hustlers saw me walking. was like, yo, yo, Troy, you need something? Yo, Troy, you, you want to get in a cab? Yo, Troy, here's $10. Here's $20. They just give it to you. So by the time I would get to my game at 12 to 15 years old, I had $100 in my pocket by the time I got there because that was the environment back then where, you know, everybody – had money and everybody was willing to give you money. If you had a bright idea, they was going to get behind it. And he comes from that era. You know what I'm saying? So that was one of the problems when he got home. You know, people say that niggas was giving him a bag. That's not true. You know what I'm saying? Because when he got home, he couldn't understand how certain dudes was eating. And they wasn't even feeding the dudes in their own crews. They wasn't even feeding. You know, it's one thing for somebody to say, say, I'm a See, I'm sitting on a hundred thousand or half a million dollars or a million dollars. If you my man, there should be some form of a reflection of that in your life. And he would be mad at that because he would look at dudes and he wouldn't see that happening. And and he that would be like, damn, you know, if 
if I had it, it would be a reflection all around me that everybody got it. And that was one of the disappointments to him because that wasn't taking place in this new, you know, when he touched down, you know what I'm saying? So he was definitely a dude that you ain't gonna, you ain't gonna have no problem sitting around him. If he got it, you got it. You got a master plan, he getting behind it. That's how he was. And it wasn't even a thing of, he had to know you. Nigga could have just told you, told him about what you working on. And he would have told that person, you know, get that to him. Uh, tell him to see me later. Got you. And, uh, you know, when it comes to the industry and there was rumors, you know, upon his release, even before his release, it was rumors that he had some type of connections with like uh, P. Diddy or uh, Dame Dash. Is there any truth to this or does he have any connections to the industry? No, I, you know, uh, Poe, you know, it, when you say connections, he has connections because all these people know who he is. If they not dealt with him, met with him or, or, or once hung out with him. Um, so he's part of our history. So, you know, if they saw him, I would assume or would hope they would have showed him some love. You know what I'm saying? So he didn't really get in that lane, get his feet grounded in that lane, you know, to really be a nasa comfort. You know what I'm saying? And I think that if he would have, you know, whether it's behind doors or in secrecy or whatever, those people would have showed him love. But he, he, I don't think he was in a place where, you know, he bumped head was head was heads with them in a comfortable environment for them to show them that love. You know, the, the five years that he was on the street. I got you. I got you. And um, just g giving a little background when it comes to, you know, the east side versus the west side, Alpo. Did, did he tell? Did he did he describe the difference? Oh yeah, you know, the east side was like. You know, the West Side, he was always infatuated with because that's where the hustlers was. That was where the young boys that he was inspired by, that's where they was at. But on the East Side was where he got his love, is where he was, you know, that was his backyard. You know what I'm saying? It was just love. It was just, you know, he he's like a he's like a rock star from there. You know what I'm saying? To this day. So so it was two different things. Like, he was out on the West Side he was negro on the east side you know he was he was his true puerto rican self on the on the on the on the on the east side because we used to have a joke and um when he was on the east side and when i was with him and he see like old spanish people that knew his mother and i like knew him since he was little he get right into that talking like me that panic i think they 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 he get right into that but then when we get on the west side where he went around the blacks, you don't see no sign. I just like, you know, you're a fake Puerto Rican, man. You know, you're a fake Puerto Rican. So we used to always joke about that. You know what I'm saying? So, um, but his roots, and he took pride in that Puerto Rican, you know, the Puerto Rican, you know, that he was Puerto Rican. But um, it was definitely a big, big, big difference because the he knew people, he went hard with people on the west side, but the people on the east side was like, they all lived in one big house together. You know what I'm saying? It was a different kind of love on that east side for him. Now, I don't know if, like, again, with, like, the Rich Porter situation, I don't know if you want to speak on it because I'm sure it's in your book. Um, when it comes to his relationship with Rich Porter, how long he knew him, as well as, um, you know, what what made him upset with him? I mean, all that's in the book. You know what I'm saying? I got to, you know, you got to go to the book to read that. Um, and, and And it's clear. You know what I'm saying? And like I said, that Alpo 20, almost 30 years ago now, but 27 years ago, at that time, was locked into the street ideology of I'm playing this game when I'm playing it at the highest level. So the decisions he made with Rich and 14 other people at that time was all decisions based off of I'm playing the game, I'm playing at the highest level, I'm only 20-something years old, and this makes sense at that time. And that's what he always explained to me. Um, I don't want to put words in his mouth, you know, I could not, but that's what he always explained to me. The outpo that I knew 14 years later was very clear on I could have did a lot of things a different way. I could have handled, uh, especially Rich and so many other situations, a whole different way. And um, so that's what I would say about that. But the rest of it is in the book. 
Um, if you read it, you know, you can go in there and see, you know, how I break it down. Dope, dope. Y'all definitely go get that book. So, uh, man, a story that has never been told. A lot of stuff, a lot of background, a lot of things that people have been wanting to know is inside that book. So y'all go check out that book. Mm -hmm. But um, now, like Alpo, like it's, it's other people in media, like um, who has books that was coming out or was speaking to him, like uh, Miss T. Did he, what was his relationship? What, what did he speak about when it came to Miss T? I mean, him and Miss T was good people. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I think they, you know, they, they did their little thing. You know what I'm saying? And they was good peoples. And he liked her. He liked her a lot, believe it or not. You know what I'm saying? So, um, you know, she, she got some stuff she's going to put in her book that happened where I was there a few times with him and her. You know, I don't want to tell what's going to be in her book uh, or whatever because she asked me because she put it in there. And I was like, do you? Um, but you know, he liked her and they was good people. And more so he liked her just as far as, you know, she was trying to help him get his story out. So he had love for her just for that. You know, you got to remember sometime in life, you got to go with what's willing to go with you. And, you know, not everybody going to go with you. So you got to go with what's willing to go with you. And, um, she was one of the people willing to go with him. You know what I'm saying? And, and 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 try to help and open up any door that she could get him in or whatever. So, you know, he had love for people like that. And he definitely had love for her. Um, you know, one time, you know, she put in a book where, where, you know, we called up. I was on a call. I connected the call. He called up into the Beat 139. And, um, you know, in the show, he was like, yo, she told us she was going to be on the show. And we was like, he was like, yo, let's call up there, little bro. Let's call up there. I was like, all right, yeah, let's show her some love. And uh, he called up there. He didn't say much. But he was just like, yo, this is Alpo. And, uh, you know, we did that to play a joke on her to help support her and show her some love. So so I was on that call with them. So she, you know, but she, whatever else she got, you know, I've definitely been around a couple of times where she, um, you know, he definitely had love for her, man. Definitely had love for her. Dope, dope, dope. And, um, like, when it came to, like, people, you know, different people putting out different things the time when he was, when he got released before he died, um, did he have something to say about any of the stuff that the media was putting out at that time? Like, during that era of him getting out of jail and, you know, what people were saying, like, even when there was a situation with the Jim Jones dice game and they was trying to say that he was there and did, did he have any, like, did he speak on any of these issues that was going on on social media online? No, I mean... At first he didn't, but yeah, he did later. Um, and then he started addressing a lot of it. But, you know, I used to always try to talk him off the ledge, you know what I'm saying, and just tell him, like, you know, you know, big bro, you, you know, you're not normal. And uh, what you did wasn't normal. So people going to talk about it. You know, you got to respect that. You know, whether somebody's talking good or they talking bad, it's what it is. You know what I'm saying? And you got to get, you know, you got to get some tough skin because it's only going to get worse. You know what I'm saying? And, and this is conversations we used to have. And I say, yo, you got to get some tough skin about it because, you know, the more you step out in the public, the worse it's going to get. But that noise will go away when you start explaining your story. You know what I'm saying? So um, at first, it didn't really bother him. But the, the closer he got to New York City, it started bothering him. And I put that in the book. You know what I'm saying? Like, like, like the whole breakdown of each step of how it started bothering him. All of that is in the book. Got you, got you. That's dope. That's dope. And a couple of more questions, um, because I know I definitely want them to get that book, check out that book, and get the, you know, the real feel of the story. Um, he Troy Reed blessing us with some of the information to get y'all, you know, geared up to go grab that book. But um when it came down to Alpo coming home and being in witness protection like was he in witness protection when he came home like what was what was what was that about oh yeah no he definitely was in witness protection and in a book once again i explain that for detail for detail because that's a hell of a that was a hell of an experience even for me you know so for him forget about it you know what i'm saying because as i try to tell people just imagine Al Capone, uh, Sammy the Bull, John Gotti, Nicky Barnes, Frank Lucas, 
he was, and, and, and take out the witness protection, but just imagine as far as for John Gotti and the, and the guys that stood firm, imagine the level of the process they're going through through the federal and U.S. marshal system. Now switch that over to the ones that test that became government informants, Nikki Barnes, uh, Sammy the Bull, and Alpo. They're experiencing something same level but different. And that experience that I walked through with him was amazing. It was like, especially as a journalist, especially as somebody, you know, I'm actually documenting this stuff. You know what I'm saying? So it, it blew my mind. It was each phone call I got, I was always on the edge, like, all right, I want to hear what this phone call is going to be about. I want to I wanna know what this, I want to know where he's at today. You know what I'm saying? And each call every day was that. And I, and I walk you through those steps in the book. I walk you through those steps of each call and everything. So, you know, if you want to hear it step by step, you know, you can definitely read that. Dope, dope, dope. And uh, one last question. Um, when it came to Alpo, you know, we, we, we got the part where he, he comes home, you know, we want them to check out when it comes to the witness protection. But let me ask you, like, when Alpo, like, what what was his financial status um, on the streets? Was he still, like, the same, you know, money-getting dude? Was he back hustling? Like, what was his status on, like, far as uh, financial when he came I'm, home? I mean, we all know that. You know what I'm saying? You know, so that's not no secret. But when he touched down, he was good. The government made sure he was good. He was doing better than most people. You know what I'm saying? Because they put him in a position to do better. And then he opened up his own business and he was doing even better. Once he started getting away from that assistance and trying to take things into his own matter and not giving himself time to develop, you know, on the right track, is when things started getting a little bit harder for him. Because like I said, he thought that people that should have been looking out was going to look out. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, I just kept telling him all the time, like, you know, big bro, listen, your moment is coming, but it's going to, it's, it's going to come, but sometimes it takes a little bit of a process, but it's coming. You know, the world is going to see you on a big screen. Why? Because the world needs you. Your story, the world needs your story, whether good or bad, government informant or stand up guy. The world needs your story. Netflix, Hulu, Facebook, they need content. And your story is some of the top of the echelon in the world to get from. So your day is coming. And I always would tell them that your movie is coming, your book is coming, your script is coming. So it's just a little patience. So because he started getting impatient, that made him a little bit more desperate. So now he's doing things out of desperateness. You know what I'm saying? And and that's that's just the situation that he was in. He was not because he needed to be, because he chose that. He chose to be a little impatient, and he started doing a little certain things out of desperateness. And that's where, you know, if he was in any financial situation, that's what it was because, and that's why. But don't get it twisted. His day was coming. And he was going to be right back in pocket. You know what I'm saying? So that's what I used to always tell him because it was inevitable. You know, it was definitely going to happen. But, you know, sometimes we could think we helping ourselves, but we really hurting ourselves. No, oh, dope, dope, man. I, look, I appreciate this interview. This was like, man, <laughs> bad mm -hmm. boy. I definitely got to uh, listen to this back myself. Right, thank uh, you, brother. Dope, bro. I, I appreciate that. Uh, one more time, don't let them know where they can find the book. The name of the book in your social media. Uh, yes, the name of the book is called I Never Met Alpo. Um, you know, you can log on to Amazon and uh, get your copies on Amazon or you can get it directly from me. You know, just it's a cash app in my profile on uh, Troy Reed Official. Just cash at me. Put your information. I'll send it. I'll sign it and send you a book directly from me. You know what I'm saying? If you want it that way, or if not, you just want to get it fast. Um, you can get it from Amazon. But if, if so... Uh, get it from Street Star Streaming, uh, www.streetstarstreaming. Order your book, get a signed version from me, and I'll get it right over to you ASAP. And um, you can come into the DM, say what's up, you know, talk, kick it. And uh, in the next few weeks, his, you know, the audio for the book will be out. And at the same time, all of his live footage will be out. Um, but definitely get the book because 
you know, nothing can kind of tell who he was in the journey that we've been through. Because like I say, he presented himself as Alpo. But the book, you kind of get to see who he truly was. You know what I'm saying? The best that I was able to describe and, and bring you into that world of my experiences with him. So make sure you get the book. You know, like I said, at uh, Troy Reed Official on Instagram or Street Star Streaming, you know, that's where you get the book at. No doubt, man. Appreciate it, man. Blessings, bro. Yes, brother. Salute. My man. Salute. All right.